you know, in life, <clears throat> we're called to have have joy and have comfort. And I, you know, I many of you heard, many of you've heard this story, but you can hear it again. You know, when I came to the Lord, when when I woke up that morning knowing that Jesus was my Lord and that uh, God raised Him from the dead, when I knew that, when I had all my hope in that, when I had no, absolutely no doubt about that. I remember uh, it hadn't rained for months. And I was at the firehouse. And I had this new life, this new heart, this new uh, creation, this, I had this new joy about me that, that I couldn't contain. I just couldn't contain it. And I remember uh, waking up and realizing that we went the whole night without a call. And that was unusual. And uh, I ran outside and it was raining and I was dancing in the rain. I was dancing like a fool in the rain. Because I had so much joy in my heart. I had so much, uh, I had, things were so clear. I was literally dancing in the rain, praising God and thanking Him for baptizing me with the rainwater at that very moment. And that joy never stopped. It just it kept going. And the strength of that joy was so amazing. You know, when I when I uh, feel stress or tension or things going on or when I'm not at ease or I'm not at peace about something, I always go back to that moment in time where I knew, I knew God had changed my life. I knew God had given me a new beginning. And it was awesome. You know, if you look at Psalm 126, it's a, it's a, it's a song for pilgrimage. It's a song for uh, people coming home. Uh, it's a it's an awesome psalm. It's a psalm of, of thanksgiving. And the very first verse in it, in Psalm 126, talks about being brought back home. It says, when the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, when, when the Lord brought back the lost back home, when he renewed them, when he gave them a new life, when he gave, brought them back home to Jerusalem to his heart, it was like a dream, it says. It was like a dream. You know, I've always wanted that peace. I've always wanted that happiness. I've always wanted that joy. I didn't want to have to have the struggles in life. And there, God brought me home, brought me out of exile, brought me back to a place. And it was like a dream. It was something I was always, always, always hoping for. It says in verse 2, we were filled with laughter. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy that our hearts were, were singing for joy. Our hearts were uh, happy. We were we, under, we saw things differently. We were able to take joy in everything. And we sang for joy. Lord, thank you for, for, for your salvation. Thank you for dwelling in me. Thank you for being my Lord. Thank you for being my Savior. Thank you for giving me that new life. Thank you for that, that new start, that new beginning. And the people around me, the other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. They didn't say that at the firehouse. So what in the world is Reed doing? Dancing in the rain. What amazing things has the Lord done for them? Gosh. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. See, in those, those verses there, what is it talking about? It's talking about the excitement, the joy, the, the exuberance of being found in the Lord to having a personal relationship now with the Creator of heaven and earth, with the Lord Almighty, to having this new life that's found in Christ. It's that new amazing thing that you have that you take joy in. God gave every person a testimony of when he touched their life, of when he woke them up, of when he took them from exile and brought them back home. God stirs your heart with it. God stirs in your heart the times where he's touched you and he's moved you and he's spoken to you, you where you've heard him, where you felt his presence. And he's, those times are memories like they were happened just an hour ago, just a minute ago. Those memories are so bold and so beautiful because that's what God wants you to take joy in is what He has done in your life. And He's done that in your life for a purpose. So you can be returned to Him. So you can be a child of His. So your heart can be turned towards Him. What an amazing God that is. He says in, in verse 4, Restore the fortunes, Lord, and as streams renew the desert. As streams renew the desert. That you have this new life, this new uh, vibrant life. And it's like the, 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 the 
thirst has been quenched by the water, by the living water. Verse 5 and 6 are, are, are uh, important parts of that verse because it talks about what you're to do next. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return to the, with the harvest. That God has given you a new life. In that new life, you're to take the fruits of that new life and plant seeds. Ephesians 4 uh, talks about the unity of the body. It says that Christ gave the uh, gifts to the church. That the church, the body of Christ, the church, has been given gifts. And those gifts are for the body to grow. Those gifts are, are made to, for the body to go out and, and grow in the body. That, that, that the first uh, part, the first church that Christ set up, the first church was a, just a babe, an infant. And that it grows as it grows older and older and older, that it grows in stature, that it grows in the wisdom of God, that it grows in Christ, that it becomes a full body. And what uh, Paul's uh, talking about here is the unity of that body. He says in the verse uh, 12 of, of Ephesians 4, he says, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his works and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, that we're being sanctified in the Lord, that we're growing in the Lord, that our, our walk in Christ is becoming more mature, that, we have, that we're uh, building up ourselves, measuring to the full and complete standard of Christ. That that's our walk. That's who we are. That's what the church is called to do, that we're called to, to equip the saints to do the ministry. We're called to, to equip the saints. The church is called to equip other people for, for the kingdom of God. And that's what our purpose is in life. Can you remember uh, sharing the gospel with somebody or just speaking about the things of God with somebody? The, the, how you're, you're, it says uh, in um, uh, the, the, the two guys walking back from the road of Emmaus when they were with Jesus, they said, didn't our hearts burn? Didn't we have such joy? Didn't our hearts burn talking about the things of God? Didn't our hearts burn with Christ in us? Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am among you. Didn't our hearts burn with joy because of our love of God, because of the, the, just talking about the things of God? I always remember and always bring up Calvin whenever I talk about this because Calvin and I could sit in the middle of a five-star dining restaurant where there's nothing but a piano playing in the background and completely disturb that restaurant with no shame. We, we, we get together and we burn and, and just love talking about the things of God. And we start out really quietly, but then we get louder and louder and louder, and all of a sudden the whole restaurant's yelling amen because that's, who, that's what we do. We love talking about God. We just enjoy that. We burn with that. 1 Corinthians 13 is the chapter of love. All I think, say, and do, I do in love. That's the chapter of love, and in that chapter of love in verse 11, he talks about when I was a child, I acted like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. That as I matured in Christ, when I matured in my life, I did away with the childish things. He says, first we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. I know in part, just as I've been fully known, that I know that I grow in my knowledge of who Christ is. Watch this just as he's fully known who I was in him. That, that's like looking in that mirror, and as it, you see in that mirror dimly, you see a hint of, of, of Jesus, of who Jesus is, and as you grow and mature in your walk in Christ, you see, you see Christ like more and more every day, that you become more and more Christ-like, and that's what you see when you reflect on who you are. That's what, that's what we see, that's who we say we are. And as a mature Christian, I'm called, then even as an immature Christian, I'm still called to, to care about one another. You know, that, that was the weirdest thing for me. I went from not really caring about anybody to all of a sudden having this complete just care. I was like, just I would, I would weep over, over, over people. I would, I, my caring was 
was so, I had this new compassion. I, you got to know this guy never had a bit of drop of compassion in his heart until God changed him. Oh, I could act compassionate. I could talk about compassion. But I had zero compassion. I had zero compassion. I, 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 it, it was amazing to me how I, I can remember going on, on calls in the fire service and watching people die right there in front of me. Knowing I, there was nothing I could do, and I had no compassion for that. But I had to put on a face of compassion for the family of forever. Because I had become so numb to those things. And all of a sudden having this new heart of compassion and having this new drive, this new desire, this new level of compassion, I didn't know what to do with it. I'd stand in a call and just wiping my eyes, going, oh, you know, what can I do? I pray for people. Just right then and there. You know, you have to have, you have to, you know, we've got, we got to care about sharing our faith. We've got to care about uh, those that are around us that are lost. You know, that you want to say, Lord, be, but there be one lost, one lost soul left to come into that narrow gate. Lord, there be but one more soul before that gate is shut. There be but one more to come in. You know, do you weep for lost souls? Do you, do you have a, a desire for lost souls? Do you see people as lost souls? You know, is your desire for your friends and family and their lost souls? Do you, do you see every everyone in the world as a potential brother or sister in Christ? Do you see that? Because that's what God sees. That's what God sees. They don't, he, God doesn't see them as worthless. You can call no man worthless whom Jesus died for. Jesus died for all. So there's not one worthless soul in the world. Not one worthless soul. And that's the sad part about it, is Jesus died for all. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You and I have sinned, and we fell short of the glory of God. That's that's just that's that's who we are. That's the souls that we were. God God wishes no one to perish. He says in in Second uh, Peter three nine. He says the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. <laughs> Aren't you glad God is patient? <laughs> Aren't you glad God is patient, Eddie? <laughs> right? <laughs> We're glad God is patient. We're glad that in 1970 something he didn't zap the world, you know, because because we'd all be gone. You know, God was patient. He not he not wishing anyone, not wishing no one should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's his. That's what he wishes. You know, the prodigal son. I love the prodigal son. I love the story of the prodigal son. Here he is eating the, 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 the pods that, that he was feeding the pigs. And he says, you know, ah, he got this brilliant idea. He says, you know, how many of my father's hired servants have more food than enough bread? More than I. But I perish here in hunger. I'm perishing here in hunger. Because he wasn't eating. The, he, he decided he wanted to do things on his own without the father. That was his whole desire. Mark 8 talks about the value of a soul. He says, if anyone wishes to come to me, let him pick up his cross and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. That, that you're, you're willing to... to uh, allow Christ to be your Lord, to be your Savior, and that you're willing to do that for the sake of Christ and the gospel, the good news, the good news of Christ Jesus. He says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man uh, give in return for his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? That's a, that's a valid question. Do you see in today's society, do you know people who you're like going, wow, you, you can't give up that for God. You can't give this for God. You're willing to hold on to this for God. And here's what I'm going to tell you. You're willing to hold on to anger. You're willing to hold on to resentment. You're willing to hold on to bitterness. You're willing to not forgive. You're willing to give 
to, to hold on to all these things that are all of yesterday instead of holding on, instead of bringing to what is today into the, into the life of Christ, into, into God. That's important. That's important to realize that what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? That your desires for the things of the world are, are causing you to walk away from who you are in God. You know, it says forever, for whoever is ashamed of me and my word, and in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed of when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angel. That if you're going to deny Christ, he's, you, you, can't, you can't deny Christ and expect to have the blessings of God. You just can't. In Luke, he talks about the faith of believers, Luke 5. This is a beautiful story. Please turn to Luke 5. This is a beautiful story. Oh, I, I don't have enough time to preach a whole message on this. <laughs> I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest on this. <laughs> Luke 5 is about what we're, who we are. It's about what we're called to be like. It's about what our desires should be. Watch what, it, watch what happens in Luke 5. He says that uh, in verse 17, that it, on one of those days as he was teaching the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there, that he was in this house and he's sitting there and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are all around him and he's sitting there teaching with them. So he had all this religious garb that was around him listening to him teach, okay, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. These are a bunch of people all around him. And the power of the Lord was... Uh, was with him to heal. Verse 18. And behold, some men, not one man, not two men, some men, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. Now, I want you to understand that the, the spiritual connotation, that the, the spiritual thought to that is that he was spiritually dead, he was spiritually paralyzed. But no, he was in the physical paralyzed as well. But they were bringing this man to, to where Jesus was because he was paralyzed. And he says, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. They wanted this man to be before the Lord. They wanted this man to see Jesus. They wanted this man to know Jesus. They wanted to put this man in front of Jesus. They knew they knew that how important it was for this man to be in front of Jesus. So you have, let's say, four guys carrying this paralyzed man on a bed. They're, he's, they're carrying him. I don't know how far how far they carried him, but they, it could have been for miles. For how don't know, but they wanted so bad to have this man come to Christ. They wanted it, but they couldn't. But finding no way in. Because of all the crowd that was around Jesus, all the religious garbage that was around Jesus, they couldn't get the man in front of Jesus. Huh. They couldn't get him in. They had a good idea. They went up on the roof. They went up on the roof. So all around this house, there's, there's this, this a crowd of people where this man can't get in to see Jesus. The, Man can't get in to see Jesus. What they do? They cut a hole in the roof of the house, in the roof of the church. And here, this man comes in lower down in front of the Lord. So they got him in before the Lord. They cut a roof, cut a hole in the roof, and let him down his bed through the tiles in the midst before Jesus. Those men were so determined that this man was soul was paralyzed. This man was paralyzed. They knew that if this man just got before Jesus, he would be saved. He would be healed. Their desire was for him, his, for his life, for his soul. Their desire was so much for him, they weren't going to take no for an answer. They were going to bring him before the Lord. Is that not how we weep for souls? Is that not how God calls you to your desire to be for the lost, for your friends, for your family members? Is that it's so important to get them before the Lord so that the Lord can heal them? I mean, that's just an amazing story. And he said, and, and it, they brought him a miss for Jesus. And in verse uh, 20, he says, And when he saw their faith, the faith of these men who wouldn't take no for an answer, whose, whose soul, their, their, 
focus, their purpose was to get this man before the Lord. That was their faith. When they saw that, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Watch what the man does. Jump on down. The Pharisees get all mad because he's committing blasphemy. And the old man can, Jesus is not allowed to heal or to forgive sins. Blah, 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 blah. Jesus says, I guess what I can. But so that you might believe in me, he says, he said to the man, I say to you, rise and pick up your bed and go home. And immediately, check out that action word, immediately, he rose up before them and picked up his bed he had been laying on and went home glorifying God. This man knew he was paralyzed. This man knew how his, who he was. This man knew the state he was in and being before the Lord, it was changed in the blink of an eye. That he just followed what Jesus said. He followed the command of Christ. He did what Jesus told him to do. He picked up his bed and went home. Glorifying God. Because he knew that God had changed his life. He knew God had worked it right there. He knew what happened. Watch what happens in the next verse. In amazement, all those who saw what happened were amazed. The amazement seized them all. And they glorified God. And were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. We have seen God. We have seen the power of God. Today, we have seen the power of Christ today. We've seen the Word of God who became flesh do that. Isn't that an amazing story? That's an amazing story that we're called to be like those four men where we have this knowledge. We know that if people come before the Lord, we know that if people are before Christ and they have the opportunity to hear Him, the opportunity to be with Him, what that will do for them. They hungered and thirsted for that man's soul. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Every person who is a believer in Jesus Christ, everyone who claims to be a disciple of God, to be a children of God, to be a disciple of Christ, everyone who claims that, this is the command of God. This is the Great Commission. This is your purpose that He's given you. He says, all authority has been given in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You know why he says that? Because Satan took the authority from man at the fall. When man chose to uh, disregard the command of God, he gave the authority over to Satan because he listened to something other than God. Jesus is saying, all authority has now been given to me. And watch what he says. Go! Go! That, that term, go, what that's really saying is, as you go through life, as you go through your life, as you walk through life, as you go in your, into your uh, family, your friends, your workplace, you go out to eat dinner, you go on vacation, wherever you go, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Do you see that, that Jesus is, is telling them, reminding them that he's commanded them to do something? What was his command? Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Abide in me and I in you. You be with me always. Do not deny me. Pick up your cross and follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. He says, "You must listen." He's telling you, you got to be intentional about this. You have to be intentional about your walk in Christ. You have to be intentional, intentional, intentional thank you, about sharing the love of God, what God has done in your life, the Word with other people, and that begins at home. That begins at home. Hardest place you'll start. Hardest place you'll start. We need to see everyone as a potential brother. 
There's not one soul not worth saving. Jesus died for all. What would gain the whole world if one loses his soul? Jesus says that your soul is worth more than the whole world. We need to see everyone's potential, brother. I am not the judge of one's soul. I'm not God. I'm not here to judge. My morals, my ethics, my values, who I think you should be is irrelevant. You are who God says you are. You be who God says you are. I'm not here to judge you. Your sin is no different than mine. You might not see it as sin. I might not see it as sin. You might see it as sin. You might not see it as sin. It doesn't matter. It's not who I think you should be. It's who God says you are. I'm not here to judge anyone. God is. I'm here to show the love of Christ to all. To all. Not just to one or two, but to all. I'm to show the love of Christ to all. You hear what I said? I'm to show the love of Christ to all. I'm not to speak the love of Christ to all. I'm to show it. That's that heart of compassion that, that you, you have to have. Matthew 4 says, the command, this, this command comes with a promise in Matthew 4. Matthew 4.19 is a command that comes with a promise. He says, follow me. He says, follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. If you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. <laughs> you know, you can, you can have all this joy in your life, but until you're a fisher of men, until you're out doing the Lord's work, until you're out spreading the gospel, you'll never see, you'll never understand the joy that's really truly in life. I promise you that. If you're not fishing, you're not following. That's what that verse says. If you're not fishing, you're not following Christ. John 15, 4 says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit, you cannot do it. You cannot bear fruit unless you follow Christ. As you go, be ready in and out of season. As you go, as you walk through life, be ready in and out of season to always give a reason for your faith. Go and meet people where they are and share the life of Christ in you. Let me say that again. Go and meet people where they are and share the life of Christ in you. That's what's important is that you go where people are. Jesus didn't sit in the temple and try to convert people. He went to the temple and tried to explain God's word. He walked the countryside and shared God with them. Listen, you have to lovingly invite others to have what you have. You have to lovingly invite others to have what you have. It's not a forceful thing. You can't force God on anybody. You can't force Jesus on anybody. But let me tell you something. Because somebody rejects the love of Christ in you, that doesn't mean you stop. You know, I mean, here, a, a conversation I had with a guy at the firehouse one time was, you know, Captain, I don't want you to sit there and throw all that you know, religious junk on me. I said, well, I'm not going to. He says, uh, well, I don't, want you to, I don't want you to sit there and talk about God and Jesus and all these things. Okay, I'm not going to. I said, but Ryan, what I want you to do is I want you to know what I'm thinking. I want you to know that I'm always thinking about your soul. I'm always thinking and praying about you and that God touch your heart. I said, so I won't talk to you about it. I said, but when you see me, know that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> it was, became more and more curious all the time. Listen, we can't be a dry-eyed church. In a hell-bent world. We can't be a dry-eyed church in a hell-bent world. We know the answers. We know what the, what the reason is. We know who God is. We have those answers. We can't. We know the answers to peace and joy. We know the answers to life and death. We know those things. we we got to love. Uh, listen, we have to do what we're commanded to do. We have to love the Lord God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbors and ourselves. Who's your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? In, that, in the scripture reading today, Acts 2, it talks about the fellowship of believers. Who we are in believers in fellowship. Look at Acts 2 again. It says in Acts 2, verse 42, it says, And they devoted 
themselves. They devoted themselves. That was what was in their heart. That was what was in their mind. That was their reasons. That was their purpose. That was what they devoted to. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. That's what they were devoted to. They were devoted to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. Fellowship and breaking of the bread and prayers. That's what they were devoted to. And awe came upon every soul. That's what they were devoted to. And awe became upon every soul. Fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. I hope we do that well here. I hope we do that well here. Awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all, and all, look at that word all, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. That we have a common thing in Christ. That we have a common head. We have a common thought that we believe in Jesus Christ in Him crucified. I'm determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I'm determined to know nothing about the power of the cross. That's what we have in common. But we're all different members of the body. It says in verse 46, And day by day, attending the temple together and the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, in their homes they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Watching this, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That Listen, all God's calling you to do is to be the disciple of His and have fellowship with one another. To love all people. But watch this. He's also trying, telling you to find common ground with It reminded me of a story of a man that stopped by the scene of an accident on his way home. Or on his way to work. He stopped by the scene of the accident because the road was shut down. And he was making him mad because he was going to to be late to work. But he got curious and he got out of his car. Like looking up, what's going on? As he walked closer and closer to the, the scene, he saw the, the emergency worker working frantically to cut the people out of the car. Cutting the people out of the front seat of the car and and uh, the pastor and the, the driver got cut out of the car, and then they go right back in to get the, the person out of the back seat. And as, as he gets closer and he looks and looks more intently in the car, he sees that it's his son in the car. He sees his son as the one that's clinging to life, and the emergency workers are frantically trying to get him out. And all of a sudden, he starts yelling. Uh, he, he started running towards the car and shouting, uh, Hurry up, help him! It's my son, save him! Do something! See, this man became transformed. Because what he intellectually knew, he now emotionally knew. He didn't have any skin in the game until he saw that it was his son. Shouldn't that be the same heart, whether it was a son or not? Shouldn't we have the same compassion? Listen, ask God for compassion for others. Ask God for compassion. Lord, I have to all the time. There's not one soul God does not want you to, to, to be a child of His. Not one. Because we don't we didn't know who was in the vehicle. We don't know who who God's got in that vehicle. We have no clue. But we have to be, we have to be ready in and out of season. We're just spread the seed with tears of joy and let it abundantly fall where it may. That's the parable of the seed sower. Some fall on the pavement, burn it, eat it. Some fall on the rocky ground, sun comes up, dries up, burns it all away. Some fall among the thorns and thistles. It grows up, lasts for a little bit, but then the thorns and thistles choke it out, and some falls on that fertile soil, and it grows and produces many crops. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to, to decide who's going to be saved. 
We're not, we're not, we're not, we have no clue on who, who God's, on how God's moving in somebody's heart right now. I have no clue how God's moving in your heart. None. But I'm to preach the word and let God do the rest. See, what, what's the seed that we're to spread? What's that seed that we're to spread? How, listen, the first thing y'all want you to think about that seed is how God has moved in your life. What you have witnessed and what you've seen. What you've heard. That's the, that's the most powerful seed that God's given you. It's because you have testimony. You have witnessed to what God's done in your life. You have witnessed to what God's done around you. You've seen that. That's why all those people were amazed when that paralytic got up and, 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 and walked away with his bedroll. Everybody was amazed. They witnessed They seen it. The, the Simon, the man who helped Jesus carry his cross from the gates of Jerusalem up to Golgotha, he witnessed the Jesus. He witnessed the, the Savior, bloody beaten and, and with a crown of thorns on his head, trudging through the streets, walking up towards the hill of Golgotha and being pressed into service, being made to carry that cross. He witnessed what Jesus said. He witnessed how Jesus had more compassion and concern about the people of Jerusalem than he did for his own soul. He had more concern about the the, the soldiers who were pinning him to the cross than he did for his own soul. He had more concern about the thief on the cross than he did for his own soul. That's what that Simon uh, of Cyrene witnessed. That's what he knew about. He went up to uh, Antioch. He went up to Antioch, and that's where people were first called Christians because of how they lived their life and how they walked among each other. That They were first called Christians in Antioch because Simon the Cyrene went to Antioch and preached Jesus Christ and Him crucified because He witnessed that. The seed's God's promises. God is promised. There's so many promises of God. One day I'll do a sermon on the promises of God. And there's so many promises of God. But the best promise that He has for you is that you believe in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, and you will have eternal life in the glory of the kingdom of heaven. God's love. What a beautiful thing God's love is. That's the seed of God's love. That God so loved the world. God's purpose. God's purpose in your life. Everyone sitting here has a purpose. You've all been gifted with something. You've all had this gift of God that's in you, and that's your purpose. But God's Word, God's Word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce soul, between soul and spirit, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's God's Word. It's living and active. It's not dead and dormant, it's living and active. It's in you. God's Word is in you. Christ in me. has That means God's Word is in me, and I'm living and active. 2 Timothy 3 talks about that all Scripture is God-breathed. He says, he, but, but, but Paul says to Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy 3, he says, you, however, have followed my teaching. In other words, I have discipled you. You've watched me do the things that, you, that, I, that I've been called to do. You, I've discipled you. You've watched me. You've watched my teachings, my conduct, my life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, and, 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 but you've also seen the persecutions and sufferings that I've had. And you know that I've endured those things. And I've dur- endured those things by the help of God that Jesus Christ has rescued him from those things. He says, but continue in what you've learned and, and firmly believe, that you continue what you've seen. That's my call. That, that's my call is those that have, have poured their life out into me that I continue those things. That the people that have prayed for me, the people that have built into me, the people that have spent time with me, that I didn't waste their time. I went forward and built into the life of somebody else that I paid it forward, that I moved forward to what God's called me to do. He says that you, that you firmly believe in these things. But listen, he says that the things that you learn from the sacred writings, he's talking about the Old Testament, the things that you learn from the sacred writing, which is the salvation through faith in Christ. That you know those things. He says all scripture, all scripture, this entire scripture is God breathed. Is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work, that you may now see in a mirror face to face, that you are now fully known just as you've been known fully, that you have now grown and matured in Christ. 
people, I'm going to tell you what your the, the probability of what it takes for you to be grow, to grow in Christ is you have to get out and do the work of the saints. If you're not doing the work of the saints, you can't grow in Christ. I'm telling you, if you're not following, you're not you're not fishing, you're not following. That's what you're called to do. You're called to share the love of God because in those, when you share Christ, when you can share what God has done in your life, when you can share the Word of God, when you can share these things, it burns inside of you. You take joy. You take happiness. And it's something that you have in common with anybody. It's something that you have in common with anybody. That's the fellowship of the saints. We can, get, we can sit around on Wednesday nights and we can talk all night long about what we've done What's going on in our life? What's happening in our week? But that whole Wednesday night is rooted in Christ. We can come here on Sunday, and we can sit there and eat donuts. Do you remember the donuts this morning? <laughs> what about the burritos? <laughs> we can sit around and eat, drink, drink coffee, eat donuts and burritos, or whatever. We can sit around and fellowship in the morning, breaking bread together. And enjoying the life that we have amongst one another. Because we have these things in common. We take joy in that. That's, that's what we do. That's how we take joy. If I'm not building my life into somebody else, I'm just sitting and soaking. I'm just sitting and soaking. And I'm wilting. No. God says, go therefore, make disciples of all nations. Go. That's his charge. That's my charge to the congregation for the 2020. Is be disciple makers. Is take the things that you've heard from the, the Spirit of God, the things that you've heard been, that have been taught, and share those. Share those things with others. Drink a cup of coffee with someone. care about somebody who's got a struggle. Pray for others. Pray for others. Pray God brings somebody in front of you that you can build into. That's what we're called to do. Let me pray for us.